And greetings everyone, I'm Mar. Once again, this is my opinion. As you can tell from the title up there, it's time for another movie review. And once again, this is a Patreon request from my good buddy John. Good old Zero Cool. It of course is the late 80s Disney classic, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Directed by Joe Johnson and for, with the screenplay by Ed Naha and Tom Schulman. And some story credit by reanimator Stuart Gordon. Now, before I get too far into it, just a reminder that if you do want to support the channel, you can always join the Patreon. You'll be able to get access to videos early, and you'll be able to request videos like this. Now, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I know some of you are going to look at me and go, what? But this is a film I actually don't remember watching as a kid. I'm sure I probably watched it at least once or twice, but my memory of it is like... Now, I do have memories of certain scenes from this movie, like the kids riding on the bee, and that's because those scenes were used at the beginning of the wonderful world of Disney in the late 90s. If you watched my Christmas specials video I did a couple years ago, you've seen some of that in the B-roll footage that I used. Now, however, I did watch the first sequel, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, I believe is what it's called a lot when I was a kid. It kind of made my impression of Vegas what it was, and it's a film I remember enjoying. I'm actually thinking of making that the follow-up review to this one, but we'll see how things go. And a couple times in my uh, late childhood, I did watch the direct-to-video sequel, Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves. Hold on, I'm closing my window. Just make sure no noise gets out in the back. Now, that one, I haven't seen in a long time, but we'll see how it is. And that if I remember correctly, is one of Rick Moranis' last films before he retired from Hollywood to go raise his kids. Let's all have a round of applause for good guy Rick Moranis, stepping up and actually being a good dad to his kids. Now, Joe Johnson, he's had quite a career in Hollywood, but this was his debut film. Before this, he mainly worked in the special effects department. Why does that sound like another director that got his start in the 80s? Seems to be a pattern. Now, he did a great job on this. He got good performances out of the characters, especially the kid actors. He handled the special effects well and meshed them together and actually seemed realistic. His success in directing this film is actually what got him his next film, The Rocketeer, which is a film I haven't seen in a while, but I remember enjoying. And of course, we all know what Joe Johnson did after that. You know, he did Jurassic Park 3. He did... Uh, Captain America, the first Avenger. I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head. Uh, there's, there's a couple more in there I'm forgetting, but those are some of the big notes there. He's done some more films than that, but those are just some of the highlights. I think he did Jumanji as well, didn't I mean, I could be wrong on that. Of course, Ed Naha and Tom Schulman. Uh, Naha, there's not really much to talk about with his career as a screenwriter, but Tom, he also had a hand in writing Dead Poet Society and welcome to Newport. Despite being a Raymond fan, I have never seen that movie, so maybe maybe around the time I get to the season where that film would have come out, I'll work that in there. Of course, Stuart Gordon, he helped write the original screenplay when it was called Teeny Weenies, which they dropped that name because they're like, no adults are going to go see a movie called Teeny Weenies? That's too much of a kid's title. And I'm going to say, they're right. And it also doesn't have the same marketability. Just listen to the two titles back to back. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Teeny Weenies. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Teeny Weenies. You could see that they did it. Although Disney did get a flack and something called the Dunce Awards for the grammar on it. It should be Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. But it's like sh shrunk sounds good in the title. So I'm going to give them a pass there. Now Gordon was originally attached to direct. Which just imagining Stuart Gordon write and direct this film has me going, ooh. But he had to drop out due to an illness, and he's the one that recommended Joe Johnson, so good move there. Now, IMDb doesn't list a lot about what was in the original screenplay, but they do mention one thing, which the fact that Gordon was involved, I could see this playing out in his version of it with how he directed it. And that is, is that one of the kids in this original screenplay died. Think about all the stuff they see when they're out in the yard. Little bees and all that. Scorpion. 
and then stuff that to us is mundane, which is something that size would be a nightmare. Oh my god, one dies during it. I can only imagine how the ending of this film would have been if they'd kept that scene in. Oh my god, there would have been some fighting. Oh, look at my kid, Dad! Uh, the plot of the film is that Wayne Selinski, played by Rick Moranis, he is working on his latest invention, which is a shrink ray. Now, he's been working on it for a while, and all this work and his attention and focus on it, which is somebody with ADHD I kind of get, when you get hyper-focused on something, you really just want to stay with it to its conclusion, is putting a strain on his family life, both his marriage to his wife, Diane, and his relationship with his kids, his older daughter, Amy and his son, which I don't have the son's name on here, but with the kid they cast, you're like, oh yeah, I can definitely see it. And the sad thing is he can't get it right. Like he keeps trying to test on an apple and it keeps blowing up. And like he tells a dog whose name is Quark, which is an adult that cannot hear that name without thinking of, come to Quark's, Quark's is fun, don't walk now, run! Huh. I just love when my name spins around. But of course, considering he's a scientist, it makes sense that he would name his dog after something to do with subatomic particles. Now, he goes and presents his machine's idea at a conference, which, as expected, everybody's like, <laughs> There's no way this idea would work. <laughs> You're living in the clouds, Wayne. <laughs> now, as he's at the conference, a couple of events happen at the house that result in both of his children... And the neighborhood Thompson kids being shrunk by the machine. And they're shrunk down to very small size. Uh, like the way that they do it with like the spoon thing. Their size is pretty small. Like the size of an ant. Which, I'm, which with the scorpion thing it kind of is a little inconsistent with it. But I'm trying to find something. Uh, okay, get my. At minimum I'd say they're about that big. Size of the backing frog but probably a bit smaller than that so and Wayne without knowing that they shrunk accidentally throws them outside so now they got to traverse the yard to try to get back inside and get to their main size and while they're doing this they got to traverse through a lot of stuff they got to worry about the dangers of going through the lawn they got to worry about ants bees scorpions Legos giant cookies which the way they use that with forced perspective. Uh, sprinklers, and then of course a lawn mower. And then of course a giant dog. At least the dog knows they're out there. Good old Quark. A little to a fault. Now while they're trying to do that, the parents are trying to find them. Now Wayne is the first one they realize it's <coughs> or that they shrank. He tells his wife Diane, then the Thompsons are all looking for their kids, which just ties back into the relationships that both of them have with him. Because Rick, I say, is absent-minded with it. His wife Diane, she's work focusing on the on selling the on selling houses, which she realizes when the kids are gone. You know, like you doing with that? I spent too much time focusing on that. So the, this does help heal that part of the family. Or next door, the main issue going is with the older some little Russ, which I do like that they do that in there because. Sometimes they're not just going to call him Junior, they're going to go with Big or Little. I should know because when I was young I was called Little Mario because I was the Junior and I was a kid. So it makes sense it'd be Little Russ here. Main thing with him and his dad is his dad is one of those jock guys. He's not like super, super macho like the coach in uh, Arachnophobia, but he's like a couple steps away. Or he's like, I was captain of the football team, I want to go fishing and all that. He wants his son to share his interests instead of looking at what his son's interests are and trying to bond with him through that. Which, of course, he learns to do that by the end of the story. But, of course, one of the things is that little Russ was basically forced to be on the football team and he dropped out because he's too small. Which I know some people are going to go, what? He doesn't look too small. But I guess that would depend on where they're playing football and the size of the people on the teams they're playing. Like, based on that, I mean, he could make like a good quarterback or good good. What, I don't know the positions that well. One of the ones that runs with the ball and the main goal is speed. I am speed. But even then, if everybody he's playing against can run pretty fast and they're built like me to where they tackle the crap out of you and you have to fight the temptation to go, Gar! 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 
yeah, I can see why he would want to drop out, especially if it's not his bag, baby. And a romance does blossom between Little Russ and Amy while they're stuck out in the yard, and they do kiss. It's a nice little moment. It does feel natural with all they're going through, saving Amy, helping one another, talking a lot. And it makes you wonder like, how their romance is going to blossom throughout the next couple of months and years as things go along. And by the end, we actually do see a little bit of it when it comes to Thanksgiving, which I'm like, well played, well played. Now, there is a couple little jokes that I don't know that they would put this in a kid's movie nowadays, given how Disney is, but it's nice for the late 80s. Like with the CPR, which is another thing, one thing I said about Russ saving her life. Or it's like, where'd you learn to do that? French class. That's one of those jokes you watch. Ha ah, ha! Ah. And it does come up again at the very end because the little one finally gets the joke. Took him a while, but he finally got it. And the special effects for this film, great. Now, I will say, maybe it's because I'm watching, I watched it on Disney Plus and it's in the HD high res version, but you could see some of the matte framing and all that, but I feel that adds a little bit to the charm of the film. And to me, it actually holds up a little bit better than some CGI stuff, but that's a whole other thing and a whole other video I don't want to get into. But seeing how they did the matte work, and the forced perspective with the cookie, the combination of onset creatures and then of course, of course post-production work when it comes to the ant and the scorpion stop motion or go motion. It's hard to tell sometimes in this era which they're using. All come across and make it great. And of course, watching the scenes when they're out in the grass, it's like, holy, oh, they did a great job recreating this. And of course, they filmed it at uh, Churubusco Studios, which is where Total Recall and The Hunt for Red October were filmed down in Mexico. So they had a good amount of room in order to build these sets. And then when they're interacting with a lot of the small stuff, like when they're thrown in the garbage or when they're knocked into the flower and all the pollen gets on them, I'm watching them like, I wonder how they did that. Now when the pollen's sticking to them, I think I know what they used. At least to my eye, it looks like they used insulation foam that they cut into small bits and then painted to look like bits of pollen. Now I could be wrong, but at least to my eye, that's what it looked like. So I got to give them hands of being creative when it comes to creating the smaller stuff and at least making it good size and all that and everything looks pretty good. Now another thing is uh, like the scene where Nick, that's the son's name, he drops into the bowl of Cheerios. They did that by filling a tank with 16,000 gallons of a milk-like substance made from chlorinated water, food thickener, and pigment. And then the Cheerios are made from tractor inner tubes, which are 12 feet in diameter and encoded in foam. Probably that foam I was just talking about, that insulation foam, because that has the right look. So, you know, creativity right there. And like I mentioned, the forced perspective in the cookie to make it look bigger. The only other thing to mention from the trivia section, and this is more from the goof section, is that the whole thing about the ant being a baby, technically that concept is incorrect from a biological standpoint, because... Baby ants don't look at our con like our common set of ants. They look closer to maggots. Now, perhaps this is a freshly hatched scout, so he doesn't have full loyalty yet. Maybe he's just getting confused and decides to help the humans uh, for her own reasons. And perhaps when they call it a baby ant, it's just Nick being facetious and not knowing what he's talking about. And calling it a baby because it's a fresh one. It's one of those things you look at and go... Maybe. And of course, there's also the possibility that the screenwriters just done goofed intentionally in order to make their story better. It wouldn't be the first time writers have done that. Now, the music is by James Horner, and I gotta applaud him because this is another great score and it really does fit the film. But I love that that motif keeps coming back every now and then, especially when uh, Wayne is looking through the grass. Which I gotta hand it to all the cast. They do an excellent job. Merc Moranis, especially playing Wayne, the character that we're gonna follow throughout all three films, and even into the spin off TV series, which is another thing I gotta mention. I never really watched the TV series, even though I know of it. The only thing I remember is him, like, I think in one episode, invented a time machine, because I remember one of the TV spots for it was like, hey, if I hear any more arguing, I'll turn this time machine around. I did have the chance to go on the ride, Honey, I Shrunk the Audience, one of the times I went to Disneyland, and I do have good memories of that. So it's that was fun. Rick Moranis definitely carries the scenes he's in. Now, the fun thing is, he was not the original 
person they wanted to play Wayne. They offered it to Chevy Chase, which this series would have been a lot different if it was Chevy Chase playing Wayne, and I think it would be an entirely different character. And then they went to John Candy. Once again, would have been a different series and a different character. And of course, with his untimely passing, there would have been no third film, unless they recast him. But he turned down the role, and he's the one that recommended Moranis, which I think is for the best, because Moranis, with the character as written, it's hard to imagine someone else playing him. doesn't mean it's impossible, but Moranis brings the right amount of likability to the role, that even when he's doing stupid stuff, like we got the beginning where he's absentmindedly ignoring his family, you could see that he's doing it for what he feels is a good reason. He's trying to get his invention ready to sell it so that he can provide for his family. And then, of course, Marsha Strausman, who plays his wife, Diane, they do have a good chemistry. You can see why they were married and how they're... Sorry about that. You can see why they are at a little odds, but then they come back together by the end. You definitely believe Amy O'Neill as their daughter and the other actor as their son. Matt Frewer does a pretty good job as Big Russ Thompson. You can see why he's at odds with Wayne, especially that, that scene at the beginning. It's Saturday morning! All the way through the rest of the film, you can see why they have tension between them. But then this does help the families come together, especially when Big Russ at the end decides to be a guinea pig, essentially. I'm not going to go into any spoilers other than that with it, but if you've seen the film, you know what I'm talking about. Shows he does have the cojones, and like I mentioned before, he does come to terms with his son, and by the end, they are on better terms. So, the whole film, it's about the two families repairing their relationships with one another, both in the families together, and the individual families reconnecting. All in all, this is one of those films that I really do wish I had watched this film more as a kid if I didn't, because like I said, I have no memory of it. But it doesn't mean I didn't. It could be that I was so young that I don't remember watching it. Like, there's no memory up here. Like, apparently I saw Beauty and the Beast in theaters when I was a youth, but I have no memory of it. The first Disney film I have a memory of watching in theaters is The Lion King, which would have been in 1994 when I was five, which makes sense. Most of the memories I have are from five onward. There's a couple from before or around that same time, like my first memory of watching Star Wars. But if I did see it, no memory of it. Nah. Now, I don't remember how old I was when I saw the sequel, but I do remember I did see it. Which, of course, like I said, the sequel will probably be the next video that will be reviewed. All in all, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is an excellent classic film. It's $18 million budget at the time, well spent, and it made $222.7 million back. So a pretty good return on investment. Uh, of course, no matter which way you slice it, that is a hit. Even if you try to do the old Hollywood accounting, it would have to have made $40 million minimum to break even, and it made a lot more than that. Joe Johnson, excellent job with the director's chair. He definitely went on to do more. Screenwriters did good. I am curious about seeing how Gordon's original screenplay would have played, but who knows? Maybe one day down the road that would be like a comic book adaptation, but considering it's a Disney film, I highly doubt that, especially with the darker aspect, but hey... We can dream. Until next time, guys.